Hey everybody, thank you for watching Leaf by Leaf. This is part two of Your Questions Answered. Controller B20 on YouTube asks, why are you not a professor? Well, I'm not a professor for a couple of reasons. One, uh, I don't have my PhD, and that's not for lack of trying. In 2017, I pursued that very aggressively and applied to a university uh, on the coast of Virginia, communicated with their administration and the department chair over a series of weeks. Uh, I even tried to forge a collaboration between my employer and the university to really kick this thing up a notch. Everything was looking great. And then I'll never forget, I was on a business trip in Wrocław, Poland, and we were out to dinner and I was getting ready to enjoy some delicious pierogies at a delightful restaurant called Czerna Hata. They're just outside of the city centrum when an email came in from the English department of the university uh, informing me that I had not been chosen for that upcoming academic year's cohort, which meant that it would be two years before I could even start. After I got over the initial shock of this, I contacted the uh, department chair who informed me that the tipping point was based on two things. One, my writing sample was not in the f a preferred format. I pressed him on this a little bit because I had specifically asked someone about the formatting parameters and they said that I could send it as is and that there were no formal parameters. Never mind the fact that my thesis and sumptuous citations did please this department chair. But then he came back with the fact that one of my four recommendations was from my current manager uh, and not an academic reference. Never mind that the other three were glowing letters of recommendation from professors of my master's program. And I had to check him on that too because I felt that my deliberate decision to include a recommendation from my manager at my current job which is with a very well-known large corporation, would bode well for my proven ability to handle large projects and be diligent and detail-oriented and punctual. But that's okay, and I can start to feel that I'm getting closer and closer to the edge of my soapbox here. So I'll step back down from the podium and just leave it at the fact that it didn't work out. And perhaps it's in the cards uh, one day here in the future to get my PhD. The other reason is because of my current commitments in life and just the way things go. Uh, I can't simply just do a career shift over to teaching. I have taught one class in the evening and that let me know, it gave me a taste of it and let me know that it's a very fulfilling uh, and demanding experience. But unfortunately, teachers are severely underpaid and I cannot fiscally justify that hit right now. I do appreciate your question and the implied compliment there though. All right, let's rip the band-aid off here. Cosmolag on Instagram asks, do you believe in objective aesthetic superiority? One book versus another. If so, what makes one book better than another? What are your thoughts on the literary canon? How accurate is it? Whom does it leave out? How often do you stick to it when picking up books? Here we go, the good questions, the uh, divisive questions in the literary community. Uh, I don't like confrontation and I don't like division. Um, so I like to temper my opinions by trying to think from every point of view that I can. This is, of course, all of this is something I've thought a lot about and I've been faced a lot with in an academic setting and just in a casual conversation setting, in books. Do I believe in objective aesthetic superiority? Yes, I do, with some caveats. When we're talking about judging the aesthetic value of a work of art, of a book, the first thing that is important to do is to agree that there are different categories of book. And I believe that each book under discussion needs to be situated in its appropriate category. And then within that category, there are degrees of 
aesthetic greatness. Do I believe it is objective as the realm of platonic forms? No. But obviously what we're getting at is, is there one that is it, can books be better than other books? Yes, absolutely. I think where we go awry with this is when we use a book from one category to shame someone or another book from a completely different category. This makes no sense. The next part of the question, if so, what makes one book better than another? The only category I can really talk about is the category that is represented by, a, by the books you see me uh, reviewing and talking about here on this channel. And even those are, some of those are fragmented into their, out into their own categories. But let's just say that category of, you know, the maximalist fiction like Pinchon and Volmon and, and Joyce and on down the line. What makes one better than the other is to perform at such a degree that it elates the reader until the reader is completely overwhelmed. And by this I mean, you know, his subject matter takes on things that are very large. War, death, consciousness, God, and it exhausts all of these areas of discursivity, to use Foucault's word. The way in which it presents it uses the entire gamut of literary devices, but doesn't just do these things exhaustively just for the sake of doing it. It does it well. It is apparent that the author is so well versed in his or her subject and in the craft of writing that they can use and break all the rules in a very artistic way. The cognitive power stimulates you to go and start researching subjects on your own. The symbolism, the metaphor, the imaginative narrative is so rich that it is almost impossible to have come from a single person. So anyway, not to belabor the point, but yes, I believe that one book can be better than the other in terms of aesthetic quality, but we must situate them into the proper categories and use the correct rubric for that category. What are your thoughts on the literary canon? By this, I'm going to assume that you mean something akin to Harold Bloom's Western canon from his 1994 book of the same name. I love the Western canon. Uh, how accurate is it? I don't think I'm qualified to talk about that. And where we often go awry is in jumping into this discussion without really having the breadth of experience and learning needed to really talk about it on good ground. Whom does it leave out? It leaves a lot of people out, obviously. That's been the big rub. It's a very, very unfortunate historical truth that a lot of the authors and books that have been left out have been left out because of the fact that they are so new. And we can split hairs here and dig through history, but I think it's pretty clear that certain types of people have historically been prevented from having an artistic voice, which is extremely disheartening and extremely sad. But in order to be canonized, lots of time has to go by to, you know, ensure that you haven't just produced a period piece. And that is unfortunate and flies in the face of our more and more aggressive need for immediacy in this topic to be immediately canonized. But I think as time goes on, there are gonna be a lot of books that are currently not canonized that will be because enough time will have gone by. I believe that every book that has been given obvious efforts from the writer should be a candidate for the canon, absolutely. And in fact, on this topic, uh, and another one coming up, I actually uh, am thinking more and more that we should forget about the author until much later, but more on that in a minute. And then you said, how often do you stick to it when picking up books? Uh, well, hardly ever. <laughs> 
I don't think about the the canon when I go and pick up a book. I, as I've talked about in my first Q&A video, I'm led by intuition. One book leads to another. Uh, something I may read in an article or over here will jog uh, so, something in my memory and, and I'll uh, want to read a book. I am, however, doing the Western Core series, so I, I have my own sort of version of a canon, I guess, uh, here on the channel. Uh, I'm currently in between the two parts of the Quixote, so you can check that out. I do think that it is important to have a canon. As far as the works that have proven greatness across the millennia of human history, and that it should be preserved, but it should not be used as an elite club to shame others, for that is very myopic. Tom Burry on Goodreads asks, I would love to know some basics on your process of reading. Also, what you think of books in translation, what might be lost or gained. Okay, this could be a video in and of itself. Books in translation I love. You, it's, it's almost like you get two works of art in one because you, you're you gleaning, though through the translator, you're still gleaning the art of the original author, but you're also getting the art of the translation itself, which is its own form, its own uh, creativity. I agree with Douglas Hofstadter on the point he makes in Le Tombeau de Merho in Praise of the Music of Language, which I've talked about a lot on this channel. I agree with his point that the translator's name should be just as large as the author's name on the book. Uh, it's a lot of work, and when it's done well, it's astounding. I'm thinking of John E. Woods over here and his translation of Schmidt's uh, Zettel's Traum. Unbelievable. I mean, a miracle uh, of a translation. Obviously, what's lost is the cadence and rhythm, the music of the language. You know, when something is translated from and this is, a, this is especially apparent in poetic translation, when you're going from poetry, which, you know, is, is, is basically song, and you're taking the rhythm and cadence intonation from one language and trying to transpose it to another. I think a lot is lost there. You know, the, the original author was thinking in a given language. And so we only, in that case, we only get a glimpse. We only get to look at the shadow or perhaps the penumbra of the original author. But we also get to enjoy uh, an artistic production or craft of the translator. Some basics on my reading process. I have a video coming up where I sort of break down how I, what goes on in my mind when I read using Amy Hempel's very short, short story in a tub. I would say just for, you know, the, the very basic approach is when I sit down with a new book, I think to myself, almost like I want to empty myself out, almost like, like a kenosis. I want to shed my mind of as many predispositions and prejudices and biases as possible. And I want to let the work operate on me. I want to understand its Weltanschung on its own terms, the way in which it presents it. I want, I don't want to filter it through my predispositions. I want to come to the work with the mindset of, let me see how this person sees the world. What's going on here? What are these characters about? How is language manipulated to transfer some meaning to the reader? While I'm reading, my mind is inevitably shuffling through the database of everything I've ever read and making connection points. And these I always note down in, uh, in the marginalia and, and everything like I talk about in my uh, sticky note system approach in, in the first Q&A video. But I think just at the very basic level of my reading process, it is trying to let the book operate on me on its own terms. Now, after a first read, I go back and then I'm equipped to operate on the book. A lot of how I read and why I read can be better summed up in Mark Edmondson's book, Why Read. On YouTube, Blas J asks, what books influenced you most in becoming a sharp reader? In other words, what made you become a reader of serious fiction and not genre fiction? Indeed, I used to love genre fiction, read a lot of it. The books that influenced me the most <clears throat> into becoming, sort of forming me into 
to the reader I am today would be the Iliad and the Odyssey, Dante's Commedia, uh, Canterbury Tales, Montaigne, Don Quixote, Paradise Lost, Faust, Moby Dick, Crime and Punishment, The Brothers Karamazov, Leaves of Grass, the essays of Emerson, Ulysses, A la Recherche du Temps Perdu, Pride and Prejudice, Wuthering Heights, To the Lighthouse, Borges. Those are the books I can say truly impacted me and shaped me uh, into the type of reader that I am today. The History Shelf on Instagram asks, when and how did you discover your passion for literature? When did you know you wanted to be a writer? I think about second or third grade. I don't know about my passion for literature. Well, yeah, probably about third grade, fourth grade. At that point, it would it was Calvin and Hobbes. And the thing that I remember the most about Calvin and Hobbes is that so much of it was inaccessible to me. There, Obviously, there's humor in there, and I really liked Calvin's hyperactivity and, and, and his constant capers and his imagination that animates Hobbes um, all really spoke to me. But there's, there's a lot that Bill uh, Watterson puts into that. You know, obviously Calvin was based on John Calvin and Hobbes is based on Thomas Hobbes, the philosopher. Watterson is an extremely intelligent fellow. Uh, and so there, it was impossible that I understood everything. But there was something about the fact that it was out of my grasp that captured my curiosity unlike other things. It was like a closed door. You know, and, and I can't stand uh, to be closed off from something. Uh, when I knew I wanted to be a writer, again, about second or third grade, I started writing these little uh, spy stories that always seemed to center in Bangladesh for some reason. I had, I had heard about Bangladesh. I think it's just the saying that word, Bangladesh. I really liked it. I'm not even sure I knew where it was until a, a, a much later. But that, that love of, of uh, writing sort of uh, went dormant for a while uh, until my late teens, about 20 years old, it, it picked up very sharply and I knew that, that I, I was compelled to write. Ulysses Brando, uh, 23 on Instagram, says, what books would you like to see adapted to movies and who would be the best directors to each one of them? Oh boy. Uh, that is a really good question, but I feel extremely unqualified to answer it. I have no idea. In my experience, books adapted to movies uh, are horrible. The, the movies are horrible. Although, I mean, some of them are good, don't get me wrong. And I'm certain that if I were to have watched the movie and not read the book, that I would think, man, this is amazing. But like, I just don't watch a lot of stuff. And because of that, director, I can tell you some of my favorite directors, Christopher Nolan, the Coen brothers, Ingmar Bergman, David Lynch, David Fincher. Uh, but I'm not even, I'm honestly, I'm not even sure where I would go with this. I, I don't even know how you would adapt uh, Proust to a movie. I could possibly see Sergio de la Pava's A Naked Singularity adapted into a movie, uh, but even then, I'm not even sure who could handle the task. Oh, and how could I leave out Stanley Kubrick from my list? I'm sorry for the disappointing answer. Davud Gozil on YouTube says, I'd love to hear how you'd compare your experience of reading literature, fiction, versus reading literary theory and philosophy? Good question. It's totally different reading experiences and totally different uh, sets of tools that you bring to the table. I have a video on reading philosophy that uh, I will point you to. Literary theory can be sort of a thorny topic for me because so much of it has almost crushed my passion for reading literature. There's, there's very few works of, of literary theory out there that have actually uh, enhanced me uh, my experience as a reader and enhanced the fiction that it talks about. But literary theory, especially in recent years, has just sort of become uh, a whole department on its own. And literature, as in works of art, are very much not on the radar uh, of, of literary theory. I think that between uh, literary theory and philosophy, I get way more out of reading philosophy when it's just, you know, someone's theory in the realm of ontology, metaphysics, and epistemology, and aesthetics, and uh, ethics, and so on. Because gleaning that, you know, their views of the world, and the way in which they're shaping their arguments, and it makes you a better thinker, and a better critic, and that, of course, uh, ties back into your, uh, your experience of reading fiction.
L.S. Popovich on Goodreads, who has also shared with me uh, his book. Was well, actually he and his wife uh, write the books together, and there's some great artwork um, from his wife in there. He has a novel called Undertones that I promise I am getting to. It's actually on my sticky note right here. Just finished the Manifold Destiny of Eddie Vegas. Then I need to read the Helios Disaster uh, and review it for Rain Taxi. Then I need to read the Eyelid, which was sent to me from Coach House Books. And then uh, another book, Breasts and Eggs for Rain Taxi. And then I've got it right here, Undertones by L.S. Popovich. How long did it take you to accumulate your book collection? On the one hand, there's a book in here that I had when I was about 10, so we could say 25 years. But on the other hand, I keep a very well pruned library. If I read a book and I know I'm not going to read this again, it goes to a secondhand bookshop. And about four times a year, I go through and do uh, a pruning. Uh, so I, I would say really probably 15 years. Can you drop any hints about your novel in the works? Maybe a few words about the theme, length, setting, or characters. Actually, a couple of other people have asked about this. I'll get, get to it and read an excerpt of what I'm working on. The, the one insight that I will give right now is that it uh, basically breaks every writing rule I've ever heard. If you could interview any author on your show, living or dead, who would it be? John the Revelator. Have you considered reviewing Antonio Lobo or Tunes? Yes, I have, uh, but I have not acted upon it. Yet. Do you ever listen to audiobooks? If so, which variety? No, I don't. I've tried it uh, three or four times, and within about 20 seconds, my mind is off and wandering. I am not an auditory learner, apparently. I'm a visual learner. I cannot, for the life of me, latch on to an audiobook. But then again, that's just me, and I have no opinion on the matter. Good questions, LSP.